I thought he was moaning old kit. Well, same thing, yeah. I'm going to be talking about uh, corrosion and uh, the pitting of animals. Uh, Reed Square, the examining boat, the driver. You should be on the slide dump there, don't worry. That's what you're doing. Yes. When you examine the boat in dry dock or on a slip, you often find the sides and bottom that heavily pits. The effect is frequently described even by experienced personnel as due to the process of electrolysis. All that, although it is possible, is almost certainly not true, it's usually due to the process of galvanism. And it's essential that you know the difference and understand the difference between the two processes. Rust, although a form of corrosion, will be dealt with some other time. Next one, please. When electricity was first introduced aboard a ships in the latter half of the 19th century, the uh, system used was a single wire from the generator to the item being served with the hull being used as a return lead. Seemed a good idea at the time, as it can save, save considerably on uh, capital costs and installation costs and weight by eliminating the return wires. However, when the vessels were dried off, it was then discovered that the iron or steel hulls had corroded badly, mainly by pitting. The effect was uh, investigated at length by the class societies, and it was finally agreed by the scientists that it was due to the process of electrolysis. The class societies then insisted that all electrical systems should be given an insulated wire return, and to all intents and purposes, the uh, difficulty disappeared. It did continue in a little place, but not very often, uh, due to the similar process of galvanism, which was stopped by the use of zinc anodes. However, the word electrolysis had entered the marine vocabulary, and subsequently, all pitting with pitting was usually put down to that process, regardless of the real cause. As I said earlier, it's essential that you understand exactly the difference between the two terms. Both processes are electrical, electrochemical in nature, and both re result in shell plate corrosion, usually in the form of pitting. But as Sherlock Holmes said, there is a clear difference. That difference is not only in the cause, but also in the distribution and density of the pitting. What then is the difference between the two, between electrolysis and galvanism? Electrolysis is an electrochemical process that takes place when an externally generated electric current from the boat's batteries, <coughs> or even the stray current from the shore, is passed from a metal anode to a metal cathode, and both are placed in the liquid called an electrolyte. Both seawater and canal water form electrolytes, as both, because of the salt or pollution within as appropriate, have the capability of passing an electric current. Galvanism, which is also electrical chemical, occurs when two pieces of metal are electrically connected together and placed in the electrolyte. The ensuing current that flows is due to the natural potential difference, DLP, between the two metals, and no external current is involved. And it's that external current that makes the difference between electrolysis and galvanism. I think we've already said that. Oh, here's one of the last bit, yeah. With electrolysis or straight current, straight current corrosion, it is often called, 
the external current reaches the steel shell, fits the surface, and then departs into the water where it goes straight down to earth. It does not hang about waiting to electrocute a swimmer, and it will only attack a separate hull if the leaking electrical source is electrically connected to that second hose. So you will find a lot of bullshit, frankly, printed in uh, yachting magazines. The pits are large in area and depth because of the voltage involved and are usually fairly few in number, closely confined, and will be found close to the leakage spot. The pitting density, <coughs> the number of pits per unit area, is low. Yeah. With galvanism, however, the pits are relatively small in area, roundish in shape, numerous, and usually confined to a wide band on the still wet water level down. And the pitting density is high. You should note that both processes, electrolysis and galvanism, can take place on the same boat at the same time. They're both governed by the simple laws of electrostatics and in particular Ohm's law, with which you should all be familiar. George Ohm found that at constant temperature, the electrical current flowing through a fixed linear resistance is directly proportional to the voltage applied across it and also inversely proportional to the resistance. The relationship between voltage, current, and resistance forms the basis of Ohm's law. By knowing any two of the values, you can compute the third, best in, uh, illustrated by what is called Ohm's triangle. Here we are voltage, current, and resistance. Sometimes you will find E used instead of V. And I instead of I, but that's uh, mere, you know, merely semantics. Sometimes you also find the three letter omega or the resistance. Next one, please. The effective difference between uh, electrolysis and galvanism on a boat is the voltage involved. With the electrolysis, the additional power source is either the battery or a leaking shore system, and the voltage involved can be anything between 20 and, sorry, between 12 and 240 volts. With galvanism, however, the power source is the potential difference between the crystals that make up the steel and is measured in micro volts. Metal boats these days, uh, and you are contracted constructed mainly from mild steel. Plain carbon steel, as it was often called. It's an alloy of iron with about 0.23% carbon. And starting at the turn of the last century, some five different methods have been used to make steel for raw pig iron. Not that it's useful, but not necessary to know the different methods. I'm not going to discuss them here. The end result, however, is that mild steel, as used for ship and boat construction, has a microstructure of about 75% pure iron, and the rest is made up in the form of, uh, sorry, in the form of ferrite crystals, and the rest is made up of various iron carbides in the form of perlite and cementite. These two crystals have um, a different electrical potential to the ferrite, and the precise percentages depend upon the actual method of manufacture of the steel and how the metal was cooled. Uh, they're mixed together in a haphazard manner, mat, haphazard manner to form the metal we can use. And from the point of view of this lecture, the three have different natural electrical potentials, but are electrically connected together. 
When, therefore, they are placed uncoated in sea or canal water, they form numerous individual little galvanic cells with the ferrite crystals acting as anodes and the others as athodes. The inevitable result is that the anodic ferrite dissolves and the surface of the steel forms the bit with which you're all familiar. <clears throat> People often say that you shouldn't paint the underneath bottom plate of the boat because there's no oxygen down there and it doesn't fit. That's a load of nonsense. It does fit, but at a much slower rate because the oxygen, which is found mainly at the 500 mil or so below the water surface, acts as a catalyst. A catalyst is something which makes an electrical or chemical process work a bit faster. But uh, underneath the bottom plate, or base plate, whichever you like to call it, it the, act, the action still takes place for a much uh, slower rate. The bottom plate is also subject to buck attack, or MIC, which uh, I'll talk about in a minute. Now, I'm sorry you can't see the photographs, so we'll move on. <laughs> um, you will get a copy of this when you'll see the photograph. It shows a patch of isolated fitting on the shell plate of a German built mild steel hull, which was laying in uh, South Bermondsey. The pits are large in area, concentrated in one small group. They were definitely due to an earth leak in the shore power generator on the boat and therefore to the process of electrolysis. The photograph two, we can't, we'll have to move on again. Uh, Photograph two was taken on the side of a steel barge, permanently moored in the so-called freshwater of the River Danube, which is not blue, it's a dirty grey green. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> the barge had no electrical systems on board, nor any electrical connection with the shore. The pitching is clearly galvanic origin, and when you see the photograph, you'll notice the density and spread of the pits. They're all over the side of the shell of the barge. Their distribution and their general shape, which is, as I said, circular. But as I said, there's another uh, source of pitting, um, which you will find on iron and steel boats in rivers and canals in the United Kingdom. Due to the operation of mi microbes, and is given the name of microbiologically induced corrosion, or MIC. It's been known and documented since the uh, 1830, and I was first introduced to it in the orchard dock for a certain time in the late 1940s. There are a number of these microbes that attack iron and steel and they fall into three main groups. Bacteria are themselves are invisible to the naked eye, and they include sulfur oxidizing bacteria, which produce hydrogen sulfide, um, and they are, where are we? They're called by the Latin names, desulfotoreducens and desulfuribrium, Desulfuricanes. Lovely, that all takes a <laughs> Sulfur reducing bacteria are another one, uh, which is known as Theobacillus ferrooxidans. And finally, iron oxidizing bacteria called Gallianella ferroginia. Ferroginia, I think it's part of it. Okay. Again, it's photograph three, which will show you a photograph of some of this. Uh, bacterial and it's well worth looking at that and studying it because you will come across MIC frequently on boats. I think a good 40%, maybe more, of the boats that I've examined over the years have had this sort of thing. Um, Gallianella ferruginia produces characteristic 
orange colored rusticles of ferrous and ferric hydroxide, as you will see in the photograph, and is commonly found in a symbiotic relationship with the Theobacillus ferrooxidans bug. Okay. Again, this is Theobacillus, and you can't see it very well, but you'll see some brown or orange brown patches there, which is Gallianella attack. And, uh, this table, which you can't see very well, gives you an idea of how you, after a bit of study, can look at the side of the ship, see this attack, and say, that's bug attack, and it's due to this bug or that bug. It's well worth remembering that table. Okay. Um, the cure for the bugs is quite simple, but it takes time. First, you have to high pressure water to wash the whole area to remove any loose scale, paint, salt, slime, or other crud. Use the scraper if necessary, make sure that it's really as clean as you can get it. Then you soak the whole area with a four to one mixture of strong household bleach and water. Leave it for 24 hours and then wash it off. But beware, bleach is caustic and it can remove your skin. Wear gloves, eye shields, and do not ingest it unless you wish to leave this world in a hurry. <laughs> I'm very plain. Is it all right for water force to do it? No, is it all right for water force to do it? Yes, provided it's well watered down. Find it, wash, water wash will allow it. And the um, canal authorities don't like it, but they won't stop you doing it. Um, so is that four times bleach to put out? Uh, four times bleach and four times water. Yeah. Still yeah. good. The other way around. One bleach for water. One of bleach and four of water. Sorry. One mutton, Jeff. I can't hear. I thought I was getting bothered. Yeah. Right. Let's have a look at the arrows, please. Uh, so you've obviously <coughs> known that uh, hitting the anodes will protect the hard surface against galvanism. You need zinc for seawater, aluminium alloy for brackish water, and magnesium for fresh water. Um, you can tell the difference. If you put zinc anodes on boats used in fresh water, such as you find in the canals and rivers, it will get coated with hard white coat of zinc oxide, and then the process will simply stop and you can chip it off and it will just come back again. So uh, you don't want that. Um, the, this is based on the galvanic series, which is a list of uh, materials, elements, from which you can tell which is the most noble, which is gold at the top, and magnesium at the bottom. If you haven't got a copy of the Galvanic series, get in touch with me through the office and I will send you a copy. It's no problem. You should know it. Okay. What anode should it be if there's an aluminium outdrive lead? Sorry? If you have an aluminium outdrive lead, what, uh, what anode should be used uh, with that in salt water? Is it still zinc? You will find that if, that if you use uh, that in salt water, the aluminium will dissolve. So the best thing to use, in fact, surprisingly, is zinc. Right. Don't ask me why, I don't understand that one. It's a complete reverse. Yeah. If you leave the uh, outline with an aluminium uh, cover of it in salt water, it will grow. And what they usually do is put zinc on it. Right. Some of each other, that seems to work, which is against all common sense. But then, I didn't invent it. <laughs> um, now, how much anode material do you put on? It's a direct function of the wetted surface area of the hull, with a maximum of one and a half kilograms of anode 
to a meter square of wetted surface. You can put two fuel on, which you will find 95% of the boats out there have not got enough elements on. You can also put on too many, too many elements. If you put one every two feet, you will find all the paint will come off the boat. So you must, must be very careful to do that. Too few will allow the steel to pit, and too many will cause the paint to blister by the osmotic, osmotic process. Mm. And it will eventually lead to rust jacking when the coating elaborates and gets pushed off the hull. Osmotic blisters in the paint are round, small, and numerous, and they usually occur around the anodes. So if you're looking at a, a boat with an anode there and small round blisters in the boat, uh, in the paint, that is due to osmosis through the paint. The same thing that destroys plastic paints. The same process. Now the effectiveness of an anode is dependent upon its mass and the surface area it exposes to the electrolyte, i.e. upon its area mass ratio. And wide, thin, flat anodes are the best. They're the most effective on narrow boats, rather than round, long ones. Its mass determines how long the anode will last, and the surface area will determine how large an area the, of the hull the <coughs> will protect. That's important to realise because people very often will stick on a large lump of zinc or a large lump of anode in a small area and wonder why it ceases to work. That's very careful. Okay, thanks. The naval architects often have to calculate the hull's wetted surface area. And there are very accurate and complex methods of doing that. For random calculations, a simple formula is quite accurate enough. It's not 100% accurate, but it's enough for what you need. One well known anode supplier has published such a formula that that should not be used because it is wrong. <laughs> Beware. Which is the anode supplier? Um, Can they be named? I, I <laughs> can't remember. <laughs> I think the was M and a G <laughs> and a D and an F in it somewhere, but I don't know. So pre warned, pre warned. But their formula is wrong. I told them so. You won't be able to see this formula, but when you get the copy, it's the breadth of the water line plus twice the mean draft added together multiplied by the length. In other words, it's the girth round the hull multiplied by the length. Duff's formula has left the two. So they do that amount of area, not that amount of area. And I've told them it's wrong, but they won't believe me. <laughs> it is. But they, they sell more zinc than I do. <laughs> right, okay, next one. Um, now, what is called the anode strum? If you have a sheet of steel as big as that wall, and you stick an anode there in the middle of it, how much of that wall will be protected? Probably not more than about that much. The rest of it is unprotected. That's why I say the majority of those boats out there do not have enough um, anode material on them. There's a very simple way of determining how much you need. The length of the anode multiplied by seven will give you the radius of the area that anode will protect. Very simple. You protect seven times the length of the anode the radius. So if you want to know how many anodes you need to fit, measure the length of the anode, calculate the area of each throw, that's the area of cover, 
and simple division into the waterline of wetted surface area alone will tell you how many anodes you need. And you do need them on the bottom plates. People will say, oh, no, you don't. But you do. If you don't, you'll find it in turn scatters and you'll be able to pull the rust off. <laughs> I've done it, so I know. <coughs> okay. Right. A number of sides of anodes. I've given you a lot more here. Um, well done, and uh, anodes. <coughs> Magnesium weigh about three and a half kilograms. Uh, you can get them smaller, you can get them bigger. And their anode dimensions are 365 by 150 by 32 millimeters. And with a wet, they have a wetted surface area of 6440 square centimeters. And that would have a throw, a total area defended by the anode of about 5.3 meters. You'll be able to read this quite easily. If you allow for a bit of overlap at the end, the length of the area protected would be about five meters. Five, three meters is the total area. Therefore, you divide the wetted length of the hull on the side of a narrow boat, you'll get the number of anodes you need. A 50 foot narrow boat, uh, well, somebody's like that, you can still use imperial measurements. I think personally, I think that's a good idea. So they had a wetted length of about 15 meters, which divided by five would suggest that you should have at least three anodes a side. That's one on the forward swim, one on the after swim, and one in the middle. In fact, it's useful to have two on the parallel midpoint. I'm talking about one side of the boat. So you have four this side of the boat, four that side of the boat, and three underneath. The, the four and a half one aren't going to do their full throw, are they? No, the they side. don't. That is the problem. Can I have a slide, please? Um, okay. The problem with it is the uh, irons that come off the anode to protect the steel travels in straight lines. If you want to know why, ask Isaac Newton. Because the thing will travel in a straight line unless a force moves it to one side or the other. And there are no forces to move it, so it will travel in a straight line, which means that if you put an anode on the swim, it will protect the stern post to where the point where the uh, swim turns around to become a parallel with body. And then any anodes keep going past it, any ions keep going past that. They don't go around that corner along to the parallel with body, nor do they go underneath around the square chine, which means the bottom of the boat is not protected by the swim anode. And the parallel mid body is not protected by the swim owner. If you don't believe me, have a look at the next time you see a, a narrow boat in dry dock, and the fitting will be right along the parallel mid body. The axle plate or armpit plate and the swim at each end will be protected, but the parallel mid body will not, because it's not protected by the out. Simple. You try and tell people that. Okay. Um, here we are. I said that already. Uh, one very important point. It's the last bit at the bottom. When you recommend that anodes be fitted on the parallel mid body sides, measure, not guess, measure the breadth over the anodes from side across to side. <coughs> I still must not pass the six feet, ten and a half inch limit, 2.080 meters. If they do, 
if you do go past it, the boat will jam in the lock and you will have no defense if you are sued for mm. misinformation. So be very careful with that one. That's something that people often forget. Measure the distance over the arrows on the parallel loop body. Now, painting. Never, 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 ever paint an arrow. It stops them working, full stop. When the boat is being painted, cover the arrows with soft soap. When she put that in, you're in the soft soap or wash away. It has no harmful biological effects. The arrow will be clean and capable of doing its work. You just cover it with soft soap. Put it back in the logging, all wash up, simple. And any paint that's on the surface of the uh, soap will simply disappear, leaving the arrow nice and clean. Would you want, would you paint behind an arrow? No, you know, before you put it on, stand yeah. behind it, just boil things, and then weld it, weld the arrow on and paint around it. Yeah. But don't paint the arrow itself. No, no. Okay. Yeah, no, sir. I've seen some narrowboats um, with the <coughs> arrows actually recessed into welded boxes on the, on the yeah. side. Is that going to uh, reduce the effectiveness? It does. It stops working. The inside of the box is beautifully protected. The rest of the boat is. <laughs> it's a bloody silly idea. And the man who invented it was also. How do you feel about hanging arrows? They would work. So why did you have a electrical contact? Electrical contact. That's no problem. If you if you've got a, a steel rail around the boat, which is welded to the hull, attach the arrow to the wire, drop it in the ogging, and it will work because you have a complete circuit. It's no problem. It works properly. Now. This last bit, we'll finish with this. One nameless owner didn't want the expense of getting his boat out of the water. So he paid, it is alleged, 5,000 pounds to have them fitted in the engine room. Would you believe that? I put the arrows in the engine room. Let's have a look at the last one. Set up. There's the engine room. There's the arrows. <laughs> what can you say to that? Um, John Polly, who recently yeah. arrived, he told me a story once. said uh, he was a surveyor, and somebody rang him and said, uh, Would you go and do a survey? Um, John said, We agreed at price, he's told me so. And uh, the man said to him, almost in passing, I've got a hell of a lot of eating on my boat. So John said, Well, haven't you got any arrows? And the man said, Yes, I have got arrows all along the boat. Keep them polished as well. Keep them polished. <laughs> then, when he went down to see the boat, they were all above water.